Okay, maybe I can start. Yes. I see we just went to 35. <laughs> that was a quick minute. So, uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Eden workshop on the Digital Education Hub. My name is Leonie Building. I am a policy assistant in the Digital Education Unit and the Director General of uh, Education and Culture and Innovation and Youth in the, in the European Commission. I'm here joined by my colleague, Anushka Ferrari. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about the objectives of, of the goals of the hub, um, which is a flagship initiative of the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, this series or this sort of workshop kind of fits in a, a series of stakeholder consultations we've been doing on the hub since March. Uh, the goal of which is to talk to as many uh, stakeholders and interested parties uh, to feed into the conceptualization of this hub. Um, the main objectives uh, really fit well, let's say, in our goals for this session uh, that we will be having today, because the hub um, basically, let's say, its overall goal is to create this, uh, to reinforce cooperation uh, and dialogue between different stakeholders in the area of digital education, because as we all know, digital education the ecosystem of digital edu education is, is quite uh, a broad one uh, and it involves many, many different actors across many different sectors. So um, the aim here is, is to create a space where we can exchange best practices and bring different parties together uh, that work on digital education. Um, and we can see this sort of reflected in... Um, our event today and our, our speakers that are here with us today that we will introduce uh, later on. Um, so uh, what we mean with cross-sectorial basically means that we will sort of break the silos between educational and training sectors, but also between, uh, different, uh, between different stakeholders. This means coming from private sector, practitioners, uh, researchers, uh, as well as 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 well as schools and educators and learners, uh, or or local and regional governments, and bringing all those uh, sort of interested stakeholders together, um, and as we will see uh, in the second uh, in the further part of this event, is that our speakers here today really represent uh, first of all the the research side with uh, Romina Kachia, uh, and then we have uh, Cristal Rilo who uh, is more representative of, of the, the government side of the public uh, authority with her experience within the Ministry of Education. Uh, and finally, uh, we will be having presentations of uh, Donatella Solda uh, and Damien Lanfrey, who um, are more on the private side, so represent ATTEC. Um, I will now give the floor, uh, before I do that, sorry, I would like to remind us uh, of the sort of digital etiquette. So please mute your mics uh, unless you're speaking and feel free to, to use the chat to ask us uh, questions, to introduce yourselves. Um, we are very excited about this today, uh, this event, and we hope we can, we can spark some interesting conversations. Um, and I will now hand the floor so to my colleague, Anushka, who will talk a bit more on the timeline of this Digital Education Hub uh, and the implementation of it. So, Anushka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny, and thanks uh, to, to the speakers that are participating today. The, the, the last uh, probably administrative or technical part to be shared is that uh, um, parts of this, uh, uh, of this uh, conversation today are going to be live streamed and recorded. So when we are going to, to be split up in uh, breakout rooms, this will not be the case necessarily, um, at least not in the first breakout room. Um, uh, so we, we have people participating here in the workshop, but we also have people that are seeing this on YouTube and uh, uh, that will be see the recording of this session. So uh, as Leonie was, uh, was saying, our aim is to uh, consider how the objectives of the hub uh, fit into uh, the current agenda on digital education in Europe. So um, I will give you a very, very short timeline and overview of uh, the initiative, this initiative that is led by the European Commission and how it fits into today's uh, today's workshop and how we hope we can cooperate with all of you in the future. So um, 
this initiative sets and is part of the Digital Education Action Plan uh, 2021 2027. So, we came out with this uh, communication last September. And this is actually the second Digital Education Action Plan that the Commission proposes. We proposed the first one, a first Digital Education Action Plan in 2018, but that was more limited in scope. So, yeah, the remit of two years, and it was covering just uh, formal education, so primary, secondary, and higher education. When uh, the new Commission took office, that was uh, December 2019, uh, there was a lot of interest on uh, digital education. Um, and actually, in the guidelines, uh, in the political guidelines of uh, President von der Leyen, there was already, uh, so this interest was already uh, quite, uh, quite uh, well expressed and spelled out. And uh, actually, uh, the president gave to our commissioner, Commissioner Gabriel, the mandate to update the Digital Education Action Plan. With uh, this mandate to update the Digital Education Action Plan, um, we started working on um, on a new version of it, let's say, that would be more ambitious and cover uh, adults, for instance, and cover uh, all sectors of education and training, but would also be more ambitious in terms of timeline. So going up, not just for two years, but going up to for the full financing period, uh, and also more ambitious in terms of outputs. Now, this happened at the beginning of last year, beginning of 2020, which was in a way a very different uh, setup than what we have now. Uh, and then when we were starting working on the update of the Digital Education Action Plan, um, the pandemic started and we moved to distance education. So of course, the actions and activities that we thought of proposing with this new Digital Education Action Plan um, took another, another uh, form and another meaning. And uh, I think that this shaped as well part of the activities that we proposed. Um, during 2020, for the preparation of, uh, of uh, the new Digital Education Action Plan, we did several stakeholders consultation. We, needed a, a, we did an open public consultation. And uh, actually, this action, uh, the Digital Education Hub, uh, came as a response to this consultation. So it was basically stakeholders that proposed to have um, a sort of space uh, that would give them the means to cooperate, the means for peer learning, the means for sharing experiences. So we we took these ideas that came from uh, different stakeholders and and tried to modify it and uh, um, propose something that uh, that we think would benefit the uptake of digital education in Europe. Um, and we think that basically. There is, a, there is a need now to keep the momentum going. So we all experience distance education uh, in different ways, uh, according to our personal circumstances and according to the circumstances of the organization we work in, according to the learning we engage with. And um, today we would like to hear from, from our uh, participants on the one hand, uh, their reflection on how this, this we can learn from this experience on distance education and the experience of the pandemic, and then would be in particular for uh, for Romina to tackle, um, but also how, um, in general terms, uh, uh, we can uh, move towards the digital transformation for recovery, and that would be more the role of Christelle. As Leonie was saying in her introductory remarks, um, what the hub is aiming to do is to bring together different stakeholders that work in education, so researchers, policy makers, the public sector, the private sector. And uh, we have here today with us uh, Damian and Donatella, we're going to tell us how uh, they see the edtech market and how they see the cooperation between uh, public and private sector. So I think we can already move in uh, the first session of breakout rooms. In this session, um, this session of breakout rooms is not going to be live streamed nor recorded. So we will have just a few minutes, just four minutes actually, um, where we will be in this breakout session with another person. So it will just be for, for us a way of uh, introducing to each other to, to, to talk to somebody who is here in this session with us and to share our opinion on the impact of the pandemic on education and training. So what do we think that, uh, that this pandemic meant for education and training? Is this a turning point uh, for digital education or not? So, um, Robert, if you could please uh, move us all in the breakout rooms, that would be nice. Thank you. Okay, I think we're all here. All right. I hope everyone had a uh, interesting 
interesting talk in the breakout room uh, for me that was definitely the case um uh, this was just a bit of an icebreaker you know to just uh, open the conversation get to know uh, each other a little bit uh, and now it's uh, it's time to to go to our first presenter to our first speaker uh, this is Romina Kachia. she's a um, researcher with the Joint Research Center from the European Commission. Uh, Romina has uh, ample experience with uh, research projects on digital education and different digital education projects funded by the Commission. Uh, among, uh, among those are is Selfie, which is quite a famous one. This is a self-assessment tool, uh, a self-assessment tool for schools. Uh, to assess uh, the way they uh, go about using digital uh, tools in their schools and how they can do it more effectively. Um, she will present to us two uh, very recent, recently, uh, or sort of the pre preliminary results, sorry, uh, from two studies uh, that GRC has published on the impact of COVID uh, on education and training. Uh, so Romina, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leonie and Anushka. So I will share my screen. Okay, so um, I will speak about uh, two main studies that um, are not yet published. One of them should be published by the end of this month and another one will be published in autumn um, related to lessons uh, that we are learning from the pandemic for the future of education. So these are the two studies that uh, I will be talking about. One of them, uh, the one on the left, is a study that was carried out uh, part of the Kitty Koti study. This is a big study, and this is one of the reports. And this report is um, specializing on uh, qualitative data that we have done with uh, families in 10 countries. And um, it is uh, interviews with families and their children and what they have experienced, um, how they have experienced uh, education during the COVID-19 lockdown. And then the second study I will be talking about is the study, study that is currently in progress. So we have done this with five countries. Um, and this is a study that has been done about what happened during the 2020-2021 year. So this, this scholastic year that is ending now and what we have learned from it. Uh, just to say that the, the second study, we have just received the country reports uh, from five countries and we are still working on the cross country report. So the country reports just came in uh, last week. So it's very, very preliminary uh, results that I will be giving today. So from the first report, uh, I can say that uh, we have learned from the families that a wide range of learning took place during the COVID-19 lockdown um, and video has become the new teacher. So many students found themselves uh, that they could not ask the teacher or they did not have any kind of virtual connection with the teacher. And many students and even parents suggested that they look for a video. So video took a new role apart from creating videos and sharing them. They were also looking for information and this gave a new autonomy to the students that the students were very proud about and that the parents as well spoke uh, quite proudly that the children could learn on their own. It's kind of a realization for the parents, no? Um, we have also found that remote schooling varied greatly. So it varied in the platforms that were used. Some schooling was done through video conferencing um, software. Others was done through learning platforms. Other was done through uh, instant messaging with the mobile of the parents and the parents acting as intermediaries. So it was a, really a big mix and match. And there were schools who only used paper. Other schools use a mix now of virtual and paper and others, other uh, schools try to use only uh, virtual environments. Um, but irrelevant of the, 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 the differentiation that took place, we have seen that the majority of kids have improved their digital skills and they also uh, spoke very proudly of their improvement of digital skills. Here I have to mention the role of the parents. Parents felt very tired and uh, that the, the role of parents of becoming instructors, especially for younger students, because this was done with six to 12 years old uh, children, uh, was really big and acting as intermediary was very uh, cumbersome on them. Um, 
We have found that the displacement of digital devices from leisure and entertainment uh, to schooling really surprised how the children felt with the with the with these digital devices. So uh, these are students, a cohort of students that uh, are really um, engaged with technology in a very different way than we would imagine. So they were really happy to go to remote schooling and using technology. And then all of a sudden they found themselves bored, unmotivated, and they were really, really surprised with this uh, with this change, no? And then they kind of realized that the technological affordances that were being used for remote schooling was really not matching their expectations. Um, and at the same time, we saw that children, so while they said that they were bored during these long video conferencing, uh, there were some, uh, some, some schools where um, the, they just uh, transposed the whole schedule from nine to four, for instance, or nine to two online and children felt really, this was very tiring for them. But at the same time, they, they spoke really proudly of learning new skills, of becoming really creative with digital devices for school projects, to learn independently, as I said already, uh, for socializing with friends. And there we saw that there should be uh, a need for a better design of online and remote instruction for this cohort, cohort of students. Who, who are really um, in this kind of uh, interaction with digital devices that are highly interactive and highly uh, stimulating. So this is a quote from one of the parents from a French student. And she said, the first few weeks were very difficult. There was a lot of homework to do. There was a lot of homework to hand in more than in normal times. So it was very complicated. Sometimes there were three to four assignments to hand in during the same day. I even sent an email to the teacher asking them to slow down a bit on the homework because it wasn't possible. We're drowning in homework. So this is just an example of one parent who was uh, feeling that her uh, her daughter was overwhelmed with the schoolwork. Um, as we all know, and I kind of expected, remote schooling did not favor all children equally. So uh, some children really uh, nurtured in, in this environment and other children really stayed behind because um, they were not even perhaps able to access uh, remote schooling because they, they had to do school um, uh, house chores because there of other reasons that they kind of, uh, the, t the teachers, it was very difficult for them to engage these students who were kind of getting disengaged, you know? And even in the families that, uh, so we found that uh, the majority of families had double or triple the number of devices, digital devices, than the number of members in the family. But not in all the families, the devices that they had were um, uh, apt for remote schooling. Um, families who were uh, resistant to digital devices felt they had to renounce their values on digital devices to ensure that their students did not fall behind. And some felt that remote schooling had, has even accelerated their children's use of digital devices against their will. Um, despite the overall positive, so uh, when we spoke about how do you feel about digital devices, children and parents felt they were really, they were very important in their lives. But when it came to remote schooling, both children and parents expressed mis mixed feelings. So there was a feeling of digital tiredness. Um, some children felt that they did not have, have enough contact with the, with the teacher. And as well, because of this mix and the match of uh, different things that were happening, uh, the parents always felt the grass is greener on the other side effect, no? Because my children only did paper, so they should have virtual. And those who had virtual insisted that they buy a printer so that their children work on paper. So it was this uh, mixed feeling, you know, of, uh, of the operation and the effectiveness of, of schooling. Um, and children really miss the social aspect of schooling and many, par many, many parents were worried about the children's mental well-being. And the majority of children said they want to go back to face-to-face -to -face learning and to playing. Um, I want to mention one, one family that comes to my mind. Uh, this daughter, the, she's a 10-year-old daughter 
who had a sibling who was three years old. So both parents had to work outside the house. And um, so the daughter had to take care of the of the three year old as well. So she would wake up early to try to do her schoolwork. And then when the three year old daughter uh, uh, sister would wake up, uh, she had to kind of help her to have her breakfast. And then she would miss some of the classes because uh, she would be taking care of her, her, her sister. And then when she had to come into the classes, she would give a, a tablet to her three year old uh, sister to be entertained while she is in class. So this is uh, just to give you some of the realities that we were uh, faced with, you know, and larger families had especially problems to share devices between having everybody engaged during uh, the remote schooling uh, encounters with teachers, for example. So from the second study, uh, what we have learned from the 2020-21 for the new normality of education. Um, so the national response has varied a lot. Um, I will just mention some similarities. So uh, all countries try to prepare for last summer, try to prepare for uh, schooling to take place in person, uh, while also keeping in mind what happened in spring 2020 lockdown. Um, of course, some countries went into lockdown again. Um, and a major change that we see is that uh, many teachers really have argued for reduction of curriculum, and this seems to be taking place now uh, because of the way that uh, schooling has taken place during this this past scholastic year. Uh, one of the main challenges for teachers was this hybrid learning model. Uh, they were unprepared in designing distance teaching and also consider hybrid learning as doubling their workload. So one of the, the Romanian experts, for instance, explained to us that one of the teachers in one of the interviews was telling her that uh, she was uh, doing a class uh, with uh, on-site children and um, online children. And she started speaking to the online children and almost forgot that she had the children there on site. And she felt uh, that she has, she has defeated her own student. So she felt really, really bad that she, she even for these few minutes, she almost ignored that she has a, a class in front of her attending her class. So they find it really difficult to be doing this dual role, no? Um, this report in particular is looking as well uh, in inclusion um, and th th what we are finding out that the issue of inclusion was really difficult to tackle. So um, in many countries, vulnerable students were offered the option to follow remote schooling. Um, this did not always work as planned. So some people either dropped out completely and the children and the teachers had more difficulty to try to contact these, uh, these children. And some of them even had to do some uh, house chores or work-related chores that did not allow them to be in, in the remote schooling classes. Um, and it, it also there is, um, the teachers are talking that now in this new remote schooling environment, sometimes it is difficult to predict who is a vulnerable student. So while before we had a kind of definition of who are the vulnerable students, now we are start starting to get a new uh, type of vulnerable student that before was not there, no? Uh, and students, uh, when we ask them out, when, they, when the experts ask them about vulnerability, they talk about uh, peers that had problems with mental health, mental health and well-being during this, uh, this uh, post-pandemic uh, reality. And finally, uh, in terms of hybrid learning after the lockdown, so uh, teachers were often not so keen on this hybrid learning model because, as I said, it doubles their workload. And in some cases, they feel they are neglecting uh, some students, either the classroom student or the online uh, students. Um, and in general, some teachers observe that they become that the teaching has become more teacher centered. Uh, because it's more difficult, especially with the COVID measures that had to be taken uh, into account on on-site schooling. It was much more difficult to carry out collaborative or cooperative uh, group work as, as well. Project-based learning uh, was now this year um, much less put into practice. And this was mostly uh, replaced by front frontal instruction. Um, in some cases, there we could sense... Um, that there is a, a sense of failure in the relation to blended learning and disillusionment no, of the potential of educational technology. 
And uh, remote, le remote learning has demanded that there is a flexibility between structure and flexibility, no, the balance. So on the one hand, there has to be some structure for students and teachers, but it also demands that the teachers and the school has some autonomy to, to have some flexibility because the, the context varies so much in, in different uh, schools, regions, uh, and countries, country level. So, I mean, uh, sorry. Sorry, Ramina, one minute, please. That's oh. it. That's it for my <laughs> So thank you very much for for the opportunity to share our results. Sorry, Ramina, I didn't want to interrupt you, but very no, sorry about this. <laughs> thank you very much, Ramina. Um, we see that we also have a, ch a question in the chat, actually, uh, about your presentation. Um, Abba, um, ooh, I'm not Opsianusson, sorry for butchering your name. Which countries were involved in the uh, second study? Um, so the second study we are, uh, were Estonia, Hungary, Romania, Spain, and um, Denmark. Great. Thank you very much, Amina. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I think we can see from the chat, it rang a lot of truth to a lot of people's experiences, also of participants here present. Um, now we will move on to our, our second speaker, which is uh, Christelle Rilo, who is uh, an expert on growth and e-governance in general, and also with a focus on e-education um, she also, Christelle, also has a lot of experience uh, at the Ministry of Education of Estonia. And she will talk a little bit about how Estonia became a model of uh, digital transition. So, Christelle, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, very interesting workshop. So, um, Eager to see what JRC is uh, discovering or revealing about Estonia in the second report. So thank you in advance for that. I've been always uh, a huge fan of JRC's work because uh, there are very uh, nice reports and studies to take and adjust to local circumstances. So coming to that maybe later on as well. Yes, indeed, I've been in uh, in education system uh, in terms of digital uh, transformation as well as innovation for seven years. Before that, I was involved in uh, uh, in these uh, different EU programs for preparing Estonia for EU. So making a difference is my DNA. But what is uh, what is Estonia's DNA is uh, that we are a digital society. This also gives this kind of favorable platform for education. A clean environment. If you have visited Estonia, then uh, we have a nice, nice nature here. So we have to make it, uh, keep it clean and sustainable. Independent minds is something that is uh, definitely coming from education sector. And the education is valued highly by, by our uh, people and uh, government, despite who, who is uh, in power. And uh, something maybe again to know before I'm going further is that uh, education only cannot make everything happen. Of course, we can grow uh, this kind of uh, uh, digital minded people and innovative mindset. But uh, if you have already the platform also from other sectors like uh, economy, taxation system and so on, the other, other public uh, sector services online and parents are using them and current parents are using and companies are using different services and building services, then it's already easier for education to, uh, to operate themselves as well and have this uh, mindset and focus on, uh, on educational content and specialities mainly. So in Estonia, we have 99% of public services online. What you can't do uh, digitally is get married or divorced and buy real estate because this is very closely involved uh, buy and sell real estate because this is uh, very much connected to your well-being. And uh, if you're somehow forced digitally to do that, then it might impact on your well-being. So this is, the, this is the reason behind that. Why don't we have a 100%? Though 100% is not uh, very, uh, 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 very, how to say, strange for us, is because uh, we, with our recent strategy in education, set very ambitious targets. For example, we had a set down in 2013 that 100% of uh, graduates from uh, basic school, which is our compulsory school, should have uh, digital skills appropriate to their age. 
So 100%, imagine education people, how it's possible to achieve something 100%. So what uh, uh, what was very good about it is uh, that the strategy was actually with shared objectives across all sectors, not only education stakeholders, but also other other sectors, economy, social affairs, and so on. And also, of course, private sector and third uh, sector. So this kind of very straightforward and ambitious goals, we didn't actually know how to do that, but we knew that it must be done. So uh, what uh, also was the shift was that uh, moving away from this kind of action planning or performance-based approach, like, uh, you know, the indicators for how many teachers have attended the training. So what they have participated at the training, what, what changes? So uh, we set this kind of result-oriented approach that we need to be there. We need to have the digital skills for these age groups. Let's figure out what kind of skills are needed. Uh, how can we deliver this and uh, how can we measure them, those? And in here, for example, we took the JRC report on the digital competence, um, uh, digital competence framework, adjusted it to uh, our education system curricula and student age groups and uh, just uh, started to go on that. Uh, the last uh, uh, change we did uh, that actually supported uh, us uh, during the COVID was that we very strongly introduced digital pedagogy into uh, learning and teaching. So it was also designed into professional standards for teachers. So the universities also had to take this framework on board as well in their curricula. So uh, this was this kind of systematic, uh, systematic approach. Why I'm talking about this last strategy, because now we are already uh, on the way with the new, but uh, with COVID, we got this kind of really strict feedback on whether the things we did were the right things. So, uh, and the assessment was very good. So no, this kind of document analysis or something like that, but we actually saw with our own eyes whether the services and something that we did uh, were in the right place. The second thing that was uh, in the strategy as a whole is that was that we were not mainly focusing on infrastructure, whether there are sufficient number of computers in schools, because we let it go. Uh, we let the schools decide what is needed whether they needed the sensors, the laptops, the computers, what, what did they need? So it was up to them. We just provided the platform they could get the financial support from. So we left this autonomy with schools. Otherwise you can't force certain device to every, one size doesn't fit all matter in terms of different disciplines. Of course, the sustainable infrastructure had to be in place in terms of connectivity. What we discovered during the COVID was that the connectivity within schools was good, but at homes, it got more difficult. We didn't, uh, in education system, we didn't pay too much attention to what is happening at home. And if uh, in Estonia, people are living um, not so much in the centers or always, and the connectivity for video uh, lessons might be slightly poor uh, in some places, then it was a challenge. So. Uh, what happened was there was even more, even better cooperation with social uh, minister of social affairs and local municipalities to identify where the homes are, where the children don't have access to internet. This is another thing that we have learned. What is uh, shaking our world here is that the word accessibility is somehow changed because uh, in Estonia we have free transportation. It's, it's free to go to, uh, to school, to work. But actually, at some point, we were online, everybody were online, and we had internet uh, contracts and agreements and fees. So somehow working got, uh, we had to work for money when we wanted to work from home. So uh, this was this kind of mindset again. But again, sustainability in terms of infrastructure, what I wanted to maybe point out here as well, is that we had this whole set of, or the whole scope approach infrastructure, skills and methodology, as well as services and content. And not only textbooks or something like that, but actually to take the administrative burden away from schools and let them focus on, on their expertise and this kind of content and teaching and, and learning. What was uh, interesting, uh, we were, uh, everybody probably knows about selfie, but we had our own uh, assessment before selfie uh, got into picture was uh, digital mirror. 
And uh, we had a um, majority of our compulsory schools going through this assessment voluntarily because we said that if you're doing that to assess the, uh, to mirror yourself and assess your digital maturity, uh, you can apply for uh, financial support to buy digital devices for your pleasing. Uh, and what was the um, outcome from the study of this research that our Th University of Tallinn did was that we asked what was the two or three things that were common for this kind of front-running uh, schools. And um, the two things uh, were somehow um, unexpected because usually people think that a number of computers or something like that is uh, the most valued thing. But uh, the answer was that a good wifey and a school leader with a vision. Everything else will be settled and solved. But these are the two things that need to be there. A uh, third pillar is the sustainability, sustainable networks that we have we had built over the years with teachers unions, uh, private public public corporation platforms that we indeed have these umbrella organizations for sustainable and continuous work, not project based, but they are there. It was the case that before COVID, maybe there were not so many outstanding results or this kind of uh, aha effects, but during the COVID, they were irreplaceable partners uh, to, se to settle with, with the challenges or to solve the challenges we confronted. And of course, leadership networks, because the ones who felt the most left out were the school leaders, because uh, they were the ones everybody asked answers from, and they didn't have anyone to uh, co collaborate or ask those questions from. So this was something that we faced that this was our gap at some point. And uh, the last but not least was that uh, what was different in case of Estonia, and I know that there are excellent projects that different other countries are doing, but, but the difference in Estonia is that we are doing policies, not so much project-based. We are trying to leave project-based approaches for experimental, uh, experimental projects. And uh, it, it often is the case that the ministry is it's easier to do projects because there are certain deadlines and money comes from EU and so on, but policy is much more trickier. So we do less and maybe more modest, but mainstream, but we build also a sustainable ecosystem for the front runners to go crazy. So, uh, and how, uh, oh, okay. How we actually uh, did, uh, did this uh, uh, somehow, is that we indeed uh, empowered uh, this, these networks more and more, that we have had the educators' networks in place for certain teachers' associations. They are not the teachers' unions only. They are actually the ones co-creating and sharing best practices and so on. This is there always. It's a sustainable approach and they are always operational. They get financial support for their summer camps and conferences and so on, but they are there. This is uh, how we succeeded in sharing the information what was needed. So if there were, there were best practices to adapt better methodology than the ones uh, described by our previous speaker, that not the old ways were somehow squeezed into, into, um, into this kind of new modern uh, setup, uh, then, um, uh, then this was the channel we shared the information. Uh, edtech sector is something that we have built for four years now. Uh, it's again that it's not possible for private sector always to enter the university's building and uh, open the doors and ask for this kind of advice. Uh, what we uh, figured was that we, we are not able to set up control system what kind of services are of high quality or not. So what we decided to do is to have this platform for already high quality service to be built so we have the private sector companies, the educators, teacher schools, as well as uh, researchers at, uh, building their services together to so do, so do everything right from the very beginning. I also mentioned in our breakout through uh, before that uh, what was challenging in there is that we uh, realized that the weak spot in this platform was the... Uh, workforce from uh, researching uh, research uh, institutions because there, there was too few of them in education field. So they lacked, uh, uh, lacked time and people to support the services coming from private sector and schools. So this is the weak spot. 
and uh, and what was and also the third sector initiatives because you know Estonians give uh, bear also the image of uh, we have to do everything right at uh, the first place. Uh, so with no permission to fail, <laughs> which is exhausting. Uh, what, was, what is the very good platform for uh, experimenting, and we need experimenting, is the third sector initiatives. So providing support and having this uh, cooperation platform with the third sector, uh, letting them play uh, is, is the way to go. And how we did it was uh, financial incentives. With the, with the size of Estonia, we tried to uh, hold everything as little fragmented as possible. So uh, again, away from this project that, uh, based approach and try to keep everything together and uh, make up- Tristan, sorry, sorry, one minute, please. Yes, sure. Thanks. And so this was the way to go that not, not everybody is playing in their own corner, but we are in the same, uh, in the same play together. And uh, this is pretty much uh, it. It uh, sums up what, what I've already uh, told, is uh, that we have been on this road for co-creation for a while now. We have learned our lessons so far. And I think the hub is the excellent way to go because there are uh, current awareness uh, in terms of what is there uh, for education or what is not there is wider than we have all ever assumed. So everybody is willing to come up with new ideas, new services. The, time, the timing is right. And uh, why it's also right is that usually in the education field, we suffer with this kind of uh, um, awareness about how bad everything is. It's opportunity to actually build this kind of positive image. Bad experiences, and as we heard also from the pre previous speaker, how uh, difficult it was or uh, it wasn't. So usually the ones pleased or satisfied or with good things are so much involved and they don't have the time to share it. But we need to build uh, together this kind of good image of educa education and uh, innovative mindset. And uh, we must stay uh, restless, which means that uh, we always are up to something new and something better. And this is the mindset again we have, uh, we have in here. Of course, uh, one thing that is also uh, uh, an important factor for Estonia when we also explain our results in PISA is that our schools are very autonomous and uh, they usually use their tools and methodologies as they pleased. Uh, it was the same, the shift to the distance learning was also easier because the teachers were used to taking responsibility and choosing their tools appropriate, their teach, appropriate to their teaching and also their students. A picture that is shared also with you about our new education strategy might be of interest. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cristel. This was an excellent and super interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think you touched on a lot of areas, you know, that are super relevant for the hub as well. Um, I'm going to go in, in spirit of time, uh, immediately present our, uh, our final last uh, presenters uh, and then we can uh, see if we still have some time after that for a uh, possible Q&A um, to, to discuss a little bit more uh, if there's any questions uh, in the chat. So um, our next presenters are Donatella Solda and Damien Landfree. They are the founders and respectively director and vice director of uh, Future Education Modena. Uh, and they will give a presentation on sort of their model for uh, acceleration of digital uh, solutions in education. And I think uh, already in Christelle's presentation as well, we saw EdTech uh, has a very important role in this whole uh, digital education ecosystem. Um, so if you are ready, the, the floor is yours, uh, Donatella. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's Donatella. Damien is uh, here with us uh, and will uh, answer to questions in the case they are the, you address them. Um, I will share the screen for a presentation. Um, and as you anticipated, what we'll be speaking about today is both uh, 
an example of how uh, we had several occasions to interact about digital uh, competence and digital education in uh, different capacities. Previously, a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, we were researchers at the university and we were working in that capacity. And then we moved to the Ministry of Education where we drafted a few policies related to this. And then since a couple of years, we started a competence center developing services and activities related to attack so related to uh, the interaction between research applied research and production of uh, services and products for enhancing quality of digital education um, just uh, i will skim through the policies uh, that we uh, drafted and implemented while we were the ministry of education but i think it's important to um, for the problem setting uh, speakers before me mentioned the fact that uh, to change to uh, make an impact on big numbers of formal education we are speaking mainly about k-12 now um, its central government has a lot to do and the impact can be delivered in a time span which is quite long because of uh, the uh, quantity uh, of uh, stakeholders that you involve. In Italy, uh, as a form of an example, uh, teachers amount to seven uh, 700, uh, 750, uh, 750,000 uh, plus uh, an ecosystem of uh, teachers involved in the in the education. So it's a, a more or less a million of people to uh, whose competent skills need you need to advance and to uh, and to to thrive. Students are nine million. So when you speak numbers like this, then the the impact of the policy can take quite some time to be demonstrated or to be um, uh, to be uh, promoted. What we did in 2015 was an organizational change, uh, change so that we uh, uh, asked uh, schools, each and every school, to appoint a team for innovation. So currently, Italian schools, since five years, six years, have an, an innovation team with uh, one PM, one project manager for innovation, which is a teacher, not uh, an IT person, uh, who is in charge of the educational and methodological planning for their colleagues and for all the activities related to that. Um, uh, this was, uh, this actually came uh, to help uh, during COVID time, because you had a unit within the school who would be uh, the reference for all actions needed to be adopted. Um, I will also mention a few words about what we are doing currently. Since 2018, we started an R&D uh, for a tech in Italy. It's uh, funded mainly by a foundation. So it's a, um, it's a, a body that uh, uh, encompasses the private sector, a philanthropy action, and speaks to uh, uh, in, in social impact, with social impact um, goals, but speaks also to the tech sector as for private sector, uh, because we um, interact a lot with uh, producers and startups and scale-up companies and uh, uh, small and medium enterprises developing for uh, um, a tech to enhance quality. And I will uh, show you a couple of, uh, you know, uh, elements of this manifesto that we uh, uh, promoted uh, to enhance both the methodological part and the technical part of a tech. And uh, last, I would uh, mention an action that is um, being promoted uh, uh, recently. A few weeks ago, we started a, a an alliance, uh, an alliance, sorry, an alliance a Europe, at a European level of centers, of associations of edtech startups and companies and accelerators uh, to promote impact quality uh, tech products and services. Uh, as it's clear that um, digital competencies, of course, need to be developed in formal and informal education spaces, but at the same time, they use students, teachers, parents and society will be using uh, products and services developed 
mainly by the private sector. So you need to operate also and very deeply uh, to enhance the quality of private sector um, um, actors. We know that currently Ed tech solutions are not to be found only in editors and publishers, which uh, or uh, um, those fitting learning space, physical uh, learning spaces. But the private sector will show you. I will show you a couple of of, uh, uh, of numbers. Is a wide range of solutions in support of digital skills and digital education. Um, a few words about our idea of uh, the attack hub that we developed. The three key pillars of what we think it's needed in a hub, uh, and it's actually, uh, it came of a help uh, during COVID time, is that our, uh, our center is both a physical center and a competence center, so with a group of disciplinaries and I mean people with a, a background on certain uh, subjects and methodological and cognitive uh, neurosciences. And also, I mean, this way of working will operate as a bridge to research institutions already ongoing. To, to translate what the digital, uh, what, what the research institutions are doing, are operating into something useful for schools, teachers, parents and society. What is missing, the missing link that we observed uh, in our previous capacity at the Ministry of Education was that there is a lot of research done uh, in many uh, uh, subjects, in many universities and research departments, which doesn't get to teachers and students and contents or society and, and companies. So what you really have is a gap between the um, fruitful impact of research outcomes and findings, which is not translated into and not embedded into solutions uh, for, for schools and uh, digital uh, you know, competence advancement. So you need to fill the gap. Our solution was to have a place. We are quite lucky because we are in a delightful landmark building in the city center of Modena. So the, the foundation gave us this big space in a historical, in a landmark building. Uh, we work, uh, this, this future education of Modena works based on strategic programs which are both methodological, so neuro, uh, neurosciences and cognitive sciences, methodological uh, um, sciences and disciplines like uh, model language, uh, linguistics, uh, maths done through data sciences and uh, computational design or uh, logical um, mathematical discussion and STEAM. So green science, food science and uh, visual arts uh, and whatever goes into the steam under the steam level and we work through r d units so there is a set of people working on these units in a strict cooperation and partnership with research institutions at the national and international level and they become a platform to produce different contents a continuous stream of contents formats that they that we a test and prototype together with schools. So what we are doing is both to sustain um, uh, both to sustain the schools coming to us and just ask for a workshop or a day or a, a, a year of activities, but also we test continuously new solutions and we uh, in partner with universities that are able then to um, address and to fine tune their research goals with stakeholders involved. So it, in, a, in a way we lower the overheads of research because we already have school students and stakeholders involved in uh, in, in the research in the for for uh, for universities and schools benefit by the fact that we bring to them the state of the art solutions from the research sector and the technological um, knowledge that we have 
So this is the way of working of this uh, future education model. Now. This is a place that we developed in 2018. We are starting other places in other cities because we believe that a competence center located in a city center, it's of use both of the uh, school sector, the city, what we call city learning, and it's a continuous, uh, I mean, it's a new way of interpreting what's digital competences is for a city and formal education sector. Uh, and this was, of course, of great use during COVID times because, of course, we were already there and we managed to accommodate a lot of different questions. Um, sorry, the, 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 the slide was wrong. So what is a tech? I think that uh, most of you will already know uh, what is a tech, um, but I think it's useful to make use of a couple of uh, uh, slides of Holon IQ. Holon IQ is a, uh, an Avitas uh, are um, uh, some, uh, they, they produce surveys about a tech globally. And as you can see, a tech is a wide range of uh, uh, solutions that go from credentialing to creation of contents to uh, funding of students uh, uh, to lifelong learning to LMS. So what we see, of course, is that education through a tech expanded the um, range of products and services that before, if you if we think before, were narrow uh, into the work of editors and publishers. So before you had a book and a couple of tools that you would use in the learning environments, now you have the digital environments, which is huge, which is really, really big. So uh, the tech sector is uh, very much into uh, startups. So there are a lot of ideas incubated and accelerated in many, uh, uh, for many stakeholders. So it's uh, a central to the job of a lot of venture capital. So there's a lot of movement into investments. And, you know, we all read in the news about unicorns being funded, uh, Docebo, the, the, the new solution, the Kahoot thing, the, um, uh, all the, the black, the, the, the boards online. These are all solutions that started as uh, a small idea, got funded, and then they scale up as uh, uh, big solutions globally used. So a tech sector is uh, very high in the agenda of investors from the private sector. And so we um, think, we thought, uh, both because of our past as a researchers and uh, from our former capacity in the public sector, that this needs to be taken into account uh, by public, in, uh, public investments, as usually what we saw, uh, the action of governments is directed to the, uh, those who buy uh, solutions and, and doesn't really, they, the public investment doesn't really interact with those who produce solutions. So what you usually have is a demand of products and services, which is not ready to understand and to critically um, choose the best solution fitting for their goals. What you usually have is uh, a demand which either rejects innovation because they don't understand it, or they take the risk uh is that reject innovation or they take something which is uh, a la mode let's say this way fashionable so they do things that they believe it's innovative but maybe it's not relevant for their uh for their purposes so what we are trying to do now is to demonstrate impact uh, for edtech solutions to uh, build indicators and services to enhance quality and impact of edtech solutions, both to enhance the private side, the market of solutions, and to sustain schools and buyers of solutions into this aware choice of uh, edtech solutions. Um, Donatella, one minute, please. 
Yes, I was I was basically done. I think that it's what is relevant. We perfectly know what are the challenges and opportunities of a tech of digital education. We know that the uh, rapid change into the uh, uh, the work, um, uh, the job market, into the society, ch societal change demands to uh, feel the skill mismatch uh, of every person in society, both the young ones and the uh, the elders. What is an, an additional challenge is that education has an opportunity to be more relevant than it was before, as it's not uh, um, concentrated into the first 20 years of life of people, but it's now spread. I mean, it's commonly uh, of uh, accepted that education is part of the life growth of every 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 one of us. So, what is the um, goal of a policy dealing with the tech is to make people aware of this and sustain both demand and offer of solutions for this goal. Thank you very much, Donatella. This was, uh, again, a very, very interesting presentation. It's really interesting to hear the uh, perspective of the ed sector, ed tech sector, sorry, as well. Um, unfortunately, due to a bit of a delay, we're, we're going to have to skip the Q&A um, and sort of directly go into uh, the breakout rooms, which uh, I will give Anushka first the floor to explain a little bit what, what's going to happen there. Yes, first I would like to thank uh, uh, our three speakers, Christelle, Romina and Donatella. I think that uh, what you've been uh, presenting today is, uh, is really uh, giving us already um, some interesting ideas for the digital education hub, because I see that uh, there are synergies that can be created among all the experiences that you were sharing. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the old presentation fitting well as if you had been speaking to each other uh, before giving these presentations, which you didn't, <laughs> because I, I could see a, a red thread of, uh, of uh, innovation being presented, but also of critical understanding of uh, uh, the use of digital technologies and also the ambitions and scope uh, that uh, that resonated in all of, uh, of your interventions. Um, so I'm very sorry that we need to skip the Q&A questions, but we, we really wanted to, to have another breakout room session. And uh, basically the focus of this breakout room session is to uh, discuss in a group of people, in a very small group of people, um, about cooperation. So all of you have been talking about cooperation today. And and uh, uh, we would like to know how the Digital Education Hub can support cooperation among researchers, practitioners, policymakers, private sector, schools, parents, and so on and so forth. So I will share here in the link, um, uh, the, the link to, sorry, in the chat, the link to Padlet. And uh, we will have 10 minutes to be in the breakout rooms and discuss in small group uh, about this cooperation. So if you ever experience any kind, and I think uh, most of us did, any kind of cooperation be between public and private, or between policy and research, or between research and practice, or between research and ethics sector, for instance, what worked? in this cooperation, what didn't work, and what was the unexploited potential for this cooperation. So, uh, Robert, could you please set up uh, the breakout rooms? Uh, we're going to have uh, more or less uh, five or six people in the breakout rooms, and uh, um, I'm putting the link to, of the Padlet in the chat now. Mm -hmm. um, ah. Sorry, this session is being recorded. It's the only one that has been recorded. They probably attached it to me <laughs> when we moved. <laughs> Whereas uh, we cannot uh, we cannot do the recordings for all sessions. Um, so basically, I I think I will just uh, I will just uh, mute now and uh, and uh, open the floor. Uh, were you able to to uh, open the Padlet? And open the link. Yes, I yes. wanted to uh, uh, warn you that there's only one word. There's a strength, and you can't see the other two. Ah, okay. Anyhow, the idea would be to to work on strength, weaknesses, and unexploited ideas. 
Um, I think that you should just, I mean, it's, it's like post-it. So maybe you yeah, put I them can, all. I can put way. them, yeah. Yeah, so Anushka, in order for me to understand it better, we need to understand. We need to write the strength, weaknesses, and exploit the ideas of the relation between research and practice. For it. this is the question that we should be of the cooperation of the cooperation that were uh, that were in place. Yes. So when you think about the cooperation between. Um, I don't know, the policy DG and the research DG at the commission, <laughs> for instance, what were the strengths and weaknesses of this cooperation and the, what were the, the ideas that were not pursued? Um, so what, uh, what was there that, uh, that uh, worked, what didn't work and what simply didn't happen, but not because it was a weakness, but just because it didn't happen. Okay. So if you want, I can... Uh, I can just, uh, you know, break the ice a bit because we just have uh, 10 minutes. Sure. I think that, uh, for instance, okay, I've been working in um, both policy policy field and, uh, uh, and research field. And I think that uh, one thing that I see that didn't work, and I, I saw it from both sides, was uh, uh, the different timing that there is. Um, so I think this is a weakness. If you have a research project, I mean, you all know it uh, uh, as well. If you have a research project, it works uh, in longer stretches, whereas uh, policymakers, they would like to have a reply tomorrow. They would like to have data tomorrow of things that happened just yesterday. So there is this uh, cycle, the, the time cycle that is not aligned. I, I don't have a solution there, but I think it's a weakness. I totally agree uh, with that. <laughs> to me, it's also that it's not only that if you have, uh, as a policymaker, you have a question that uh, doesn't have uh, an answer, then the timing of research results uh, is longer than the policy cycle. So this, I totally agree. The other weaknesses, is, uh, the other weakness mm -hmm. is that policy is usually not unable to read clear findings from the research side. So um, I wouldn't say that research uh, always give unconclusive evidence, but when as a policymaker with uh, the research researcher background, I tried to, ba to base some uh, policy solutions on research findings, it's difficult to find conclusive evidence because research is always open to um, accommodate different uh, outcomes. So you always say, in most of the cases, it's like this. I mean, we were introducing uh, bring your own device policy in Italy. So you needed uh, a finding that would let you see whether using of mobiles in uh, six years old was beneficial or detrimental. Usually the answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. So if you have it depends, as a policymaker, you don't make use of it depends. Uh, it, I'm not saying as a former researcher that you need to find the different findings that it depends, but research should work into uh, at least extract some evidence which could be of use of uh, policy. Can I react to that? <laughs> I bring my researchers here. <laughs> so I, I find that from the researcher side, it's always difficult to, to have this cause and effect, no? Uh, kind of evidence. Uh, because as a researcher, you're always aware that there are other factors influencing a certain conclusion or a certain behavior or a certain change. So um, you, you're always cautious that uh, when you present your conclusions that you're not, um, uh, that there is some bias, no? And because you are not doing this study in an experiment uh, kind of environment. In a lab. In a yes. room, a lab. So it's, 
at times very difficult to have this uh, very conclusive that you say, yeah, if I you bring your own device, it has positive learning objective. No, it's very difficult because there are certain things where that uh, kind of conclusion doesn't, uh, it's not substantiated by data. So as a researcher, I cannot give you that kind of conclusion. No. Then something related to what uh, Anushka said that um, at times, like so, the, the the time frame is really interesting. No policy, like you you said, policymaker. That, so now you know COVID. No, the policymaker would want uh, already some decisions to make, uh, while we are still trying to understand what is happening. And at times, I feel that uh, we are missing uh, longitudinal studies for the Same. sake. Um, always preparing a research for policy to provide evidence for policy making but uh, these longitudinal studies so something that you were saying before now understanding how uh, this uh, self-learning you know kind of is happening this is not only happening now it has been happening already you know so if there was some longitudinal study then we can see how it has changed with COVID you know so certain studies could also be done at a longitudinal pace which is not exactly what the policymaker needs but which will be useful in five years time for instance to build on what you said, I think that we can also say, um, first of all, the longitudinal studies is key uh, and should be the real investment from the public sector to have something ongoing for a very long uh, a span of time is the secret to measure. I mean, it's the anchor for other project, shorter projects to work so that you have terms of comparison of your intervention. Of course, you cannot reproduce a lab, uh, a, you know, a, a white uh, space with no interaction but at least you have some certain data uh, to have a look at. Um, just to be positive and speak about strengths, um, uh, research can give a solid basis on certain decisions that otherwise are uh, driven by uh, political instances. So to ground decisions into a benchmark, um, I'm trying to make it as a strength, but it's still a weakness because policymakers, policymakers are, you know, are unable to read research. So the, the, it's like a, a need uh, more than a strength is an opportunity, so to speak. That policymakers need to be able to access and read uh, research findings. There's not such a culture of reading uh, literature. Uh, but it's uh, the strength is that if they read it, then you can, they, they, they can use it. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I have a dream, Donatella. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make uh, an academy for policymakers. We can do it together. You know, after being there in seven years, we got to understand so many processes it's recorded so i cannot say too much uh, <laughs> so many things that you say it's so simple it's so simple it was you know that it was uh, by accident that two phds were in a cabinet office of three ministers and so we had the methods we had the, the the mythological approach of phd that you need first you read you compare and then you take the decision this is you know one would say it's Quite basic, basic. <laughs> yeah. but it's not always like this. So to have an academy for policymakers, which is not based on uh, administrative law or you know on how to design, a, a, yeah, because a that function, they can do, yeah, they they can do, yeah. Then, then we can do it together, the academy. I mean, I'm sure that's uh, <laughs> look. It would be. Uh, I think it would be very important for the hub. Um, to, to explore this kind of things, because one of the things we would like to do with the hub is uh, to create this uh, this brokering between uh, research, policy, and practice. And uh, one interesting thing, but then Romina, you know probably better than I do this part, is that um, you know that the GRC is one of the 
is the research center of the commission. So in a way, the think tank of the commission. One of the things that they're doing, which I found very interesting is uh, this, uh, this academy actually for uh, making uh, research relevant for policy. And this is quite interesting, I think. So it's um, the, um, uh, Romina, help me, policymaking hub, is it called? Um, I think it's the, it's called the EU. Um, yeah, it starts with EU. Okay, so never mind. The same one, okay. Yeah, we will look into the name and then remember. But this is the, the unexploited idea to yeah. make a bridge between <laughs> research, a clearer bridge yeah. between research. If I may add something, um, the stakeholder, I mean, in Italian it's called terza missione, so the, it's the yeah. additional uh, goal for universities to demonstrate impact into society. And usually abroad in the UK, you, you 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 have to work a lot for this. I mean, I remember in the various universities I've attended, there's always this role for universities to uh, make to to exploit uh, the results of their action. But uh, there is a, a a simplification, I think, a simplification need for research. I mean oversimplifying the findings of a research uh, oh it's bad uh, uh, Romina was mentioning that uh, conclusive evidence can create I mean uh, unconclusive evidence represented as conclusive can create you know uh, damage more than uh, benefit but to translate findings into something usable useful for uh, the public it's I think needs to be pushed and promoted far, you know, in, in a more assertive way. Yeah, it's uh, this brokering aspect. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Romina, you did it very well in your presentation today. You were really speaking uh, uh, to, to everyone, to the wider public. So that uh, um, that is part of it, I think. I think we need to go back to the main room and then we will close, uh, um, we will close this session. Thanks a million. Uh, thanks a million to both. Thank you. Thank you. So... I think we're all back and I would like just to close this session uh, by uh, first of all thanking everyone and then by announcing uh, to everyone that uh, uh, yesterday uh, a call for uh, support services for the Digital Education Hub came out. So uh, if you want to have a look in e-tendering, um, we are having this call uh, for uh, organizations to support us in the setup of the hub, of the Digital Education Hub, in the setup of its community, but also in the setup of uh, uh, its activities for the next three years. Um, I hope you can all have a look at, uh, at this call and help us promoting it uh, among, among your stakeholders and partners. And I hope that many of you will be there in the Oh, Anushka, you're frozen. Um, and uh, um, for me, oh, but can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. I switch of, yeah, I switch yeah. off uh, the video. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Romina, Christelle and uh, Donatella for their excellent presentation. And uh, Donatella for the actions and uh, for uh, for putting us uh, in a few seconds. And uh, um, I would like to thank you all for uh, for attending this uh, this session. And I hope that we can cooperate uh, um, in uh, in the digital education hub. And I hope to see you all as part of the of the community of the hub. Uh, Leonie, I don't know if you want to uh, say a few words just. To to close sure. the session as well oh, yeah. for the hub. Yes, I, I I definitely, yes, I want to thank, I mean, uh, thank you all for, for attending this session. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. Uh, the, the discussion in our breakout room was also very interesting. I was just explaining a question and, uh, and then we went back to plenary. But uh, yeah, again, thanks also from my side to all the speakers. This has been, uh, this has been really, really excellent. Uh, and I hope we can uh, stay in touch. Please feel free to to contact us. You know, if you have any further questions or, or best practice you'd like to share, 
the paddle as well is still online, so you can uh, still add some sticky notes there if you if you still have some remaining uh, ideas. And um, I think this is it uh, from our side. So thank you very much and have a, a lovely afternoon.